My name is Billy Wilson. I work for the, uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, here in the Conservation Planning Branch. And I'm filling in today for Margaret Mantor, who is currently on vacation. Uh, so to, excuse me, today's lecture is part of our conservation lecture series. And um, as you'll see on the first slide here, if you go to the web address shown, uh, you can find the, excuse me, the schedule for the upcoming lectures. Uh, you can register for the lectures and then also watch videos from previous lectures. Uh, and with that, um, here's a schedule of the upcoming lectures. Um, August 25th, we have Rearing Salmon in the Yolo Bypass. Uh, September 9th, the California Red-Legged Frog. And October 7th, the Townsend Big Eared Bat. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or Margaret Mantor um, for those you know, upcoming lectures. Before I introduce our speaker, uh, I'd like to ask everyone here in the auditorium to hold your questions for the end so that we can, uh, that I can come and, and hand you the microphone so that those who are listening via WebEx can hear the questions. And then for those of you listening on WebEx, um, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box uh, and we will uh, announce those questions to the speaker at the end as well. Uh, so without further ado, um, today we are pleased to have Dr. Kristen uh, Acalino presenting a lecture on white abalone. She received her BS in zoology and a certificate in environmental studies from the U University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2005. She earned her PhD in population biology from U University of California, Davis in 2011. And then I'll let her uh, explain further, but since 2011, uh, she has been the manager of the White Abalone Captive Breeding Program at UC Davis Badea Marine Lab. Please welcome Dr. Aquilino. Thanks very much, Billy. So for those of you on WebEx, um, as Billy mentioned, we've had a little bit of technical difficulty. So right now, I can't actually see my slides that well. Um, I am kind of gesturing or telling someone to advance the slides. Um, so I'm sorry if that makes things a little bit awkward, um, but I will do the best I can. So um, I think, Billy, we have the first slide of my talk going right now. So as Billy said, my name is Kristen Aquilino, and I'm here representing a large number of people. So there's so many folks involved in this project. Um, on my title slide, I've listed a few of my co-authors from Bodega Marine Lab. Gary Chur is the um, PI for white abalone work. He's actually the permit holder for all white abalone in captivity. Um, Jim Moore, Laura Rogers Bennett, Bennett Cynthia Catton, Shelby Kuana, Lauren Wincoop, um, all are part of our team at Bodega Marine Lab working on this. Melissa Newman is the project coordinator with NOAA. And then as I go through this talk, I'm going to mention a lot of other people who are heavily involved in this project at different institutions. So um, please keep in mind that um, even though I'm giving this talk, there's a lot, of, a lot of irons in the fire here trying to save this species. Next slide, please. So this is a little bit about where we're going. I'm going to introduce you to abalone in California and talk a little bit about the history of California abalone harvest. Then I'm gonna talk specifically about white abalone and the captive breeding program and the things we need to do to really recover the species. Next slide, please. Many of you are probably familiar with abalone. Um, here I have a red abalone shell. Um, I know that some of you might not be able to see this that well on the WebEx, but if you are familiar with abalone at all, this is probably the species you're most familiar with. Red abalone are the largest abalone species in the world. They're a type of snail or gastropod. They have a really large shell and a really large muscular foot underneath that shell. They use that foot to hold on to the rock. So oftentimes these animals are in really high wave stress areas. So they have to be able to hold on so they don't get dislodged somehow. Um, underneath their respiratory pores, these holes on the top of their shell is where their gills are located. So that's how they respire. They have a mouth and two eyes in front. And their mouth is composed of a thing called a radula, which is like a big rake that they use to eat kelp. Um, and so they're, they're kind of simple, but they're also really delicious. So I'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the history of this species. Um, so if you've dove for abalone, if you've eaten abalone in California, this is most likely the species that you've interacted with the most. Next slide. There are a number of other species in California. And of course, I'm here today to talk about the white abalone. Um, abalone, interestingly enough, aren't just called the different colors because of the colors of their shells. So the red abalone I held up has a little bit of a red tint. This one might look a little bit whiter, but we really identify abalone by the shape of their shell and the color of their soft tissues. The white abalone shell is a little bit more dome-shaped than the red abalone shell. 
Um, and this, the shell itself is smaller. So I mentioned red abalone are the largest species of abalone in the world. Um, white abalone are actually fairly large too, but people often see the species and go, oh, it's really small. Um, but that's just because we're used to the reds, which are so much larger. Next slide. Oh, we're, we can stay here. Sorry, I didn't realize. You've gotten ahead of me. This is great. Um, <laughs> so another species I have on this slide here is the black abalone. In addition to, black, to white abalone, black abalone is also listed as endangered. Black abalone are the most shallow of California abalone species. They have very smooth shells. They're often a little bit dark in color. They tend to have more respiratory pores open, those holes on top of their shell. And those respiratory pores are very flush to the top of the shell. Um, so those are a little bit differences in, in those animals. But as you can see, we actually have seven species of abalone in California, um, all up and down the coast. The, um, the graph here represents their north to south distribution as opposed to their depth distribution. The black abalone are the shallowest of all these species, and the white abalone is the most deep. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the history of abalone in California. This abalone in the upper left here was collected from an Indian midden um, on the Catalina Islands, and it's estimated to be over 7,000 years old. So these animals have been really important for a very long time in this area. Native Americans used these animals both for food and also for trade. They used their shells as currency. And I've read an account that when Spaniards first brought horses to this area, one abalone shell was valued at one horse by the Native Americans. So they really, really valued these shells. Um, and we still value these shells. So there's some jewelry here, um, guitar inlays, the earrings I'm wearing today are made out of abalone shell. Um, so, so this is an important part still, the shell of, of what we value in these animals. Commercial fisheries started in the mid 1800s with the Chinese. So this little um, painting here in the middle on top is of Chinese fishermen um, picking abalone off of rocks. And today, we still harvest these animals. So we have farms for these animals. In the upper right, you can see a farm that's in Cayucos for red abalone. And also, we dive for these animals still. So in the middle on the bottom, um, there's a recreational abalone diver. And on the bottom left, there's me diving at Fort Ross Cove um, for abalone. North of the Golden Gate is the only place you can still harvest abalone in California. You can't use scuba. You have to free dive or hold your breath. Um, you have to make sure that the abalone you're collecting are at least seven inches long. So this abalone diver has a bright green gauge to uh, measure the size of the abalone. And you have to use a certain kind of iron to pry it off the rock. You can only collect three at a time. Um, and it, collection is actually even more restricted in places like Sonoma and Mendocino County, where we recently had a harmful algal bloom in 2011, which took out a lot of the abalone on this coast. This is a really popular, popular recreational fishery. So, all of these pictures kind of depict where we've, where we've gone with this species, where we were you know, 7,000 years ago with the species and where we are now. But a lot happened in between. So if you go to the next slide, please, we can see a little bit about what the history of this, these species was. A lot of these species aren't doing very well. And I really, really love this illustration from A.L. Lundy's um, California Abalone History. If you ever get a chance to pick up the book, please do. It talks a lot about um, the social and political and economic history of abalone fishing. It's really fascinating. So this, this depiction shows the early fishing by Chinese fishermen in the 1800s. Um, interestingly enough, they, so, so when the Chinese first came here, often they were coming against their will with the gold rush. Um, they had been fishing abalone in their, at their homes. Um, they got taken, oftentimes, like I said, against their will to the US. Um, and they started fishing abalone here. And they were pretty darn excited because, as I mentioned, red abalone are the largest species of abalone in the world. So when they first saw red abalone in California, they were pretty excited. And most of the abalone that they were fishing, they were sending back home to China. Unfortunately, because of a lot of pretty horrible um, and racist politics at the time, Chinese were really pushed out of this fishery around the turn of the century. So some le uh, legislation was passed that actually um, made it so that Chinese couldn't leave and re-enter the country. And they actually banned the drying of abalone. Um, clearly, this was the only thing that uh, was, this was, this was necessary for sending abalone across the ocean um, to dry it and to be able to ship it. And so it really ended the Chinese market in abalone. Interestingly, around the same time, Japanese divers started to become interested in fishing abalone in California. And they brought a lot of really amazing technology to diving uh, or to abalone fishing. They were able to go deeper than the Chinese fishermen who were only fishing from boats and from shore. Um, and they were able to access a lot of abalone that the Chinese fishermen weren't able to. 
Politics enters the picture again, though. So what happens in 1941? Japanese and California are interned um, because of World War II. And so that, again, ended the abalone fishery temporarily in California. When a lot of young, mostly white, soldiers came back from World War II, they were looking for jobs. And so a lot of them thought, OK, here's a kind of empty industry that we can pick up and we can, we can try out. And so that kind of the, the Caucasian um, group started fishing abalone. And the, a lot of the people who started diving at this time were pretty cavalier about it, maybe because they'd just been to war. Um, they weren't that familiar with the equipment. So if you want to hear some really nasty, gnarly diving stories, these are the, this is the time period to look at. You know, when these guys come back from war and they're trying to use this Japanese equipment and they have no idea what they're doing and they get sucked out of a little hole in their hard hat. Um, so it's, it's pretty gruesome. Um, and it, We've learned a lot about diving since then. We've gotten better at diving since then. Our technology has improved. And we've been able to go deeper and deeper and access more and more of these animals, as this illustration suggests. So really, the decline of California abalone is primarily from overfishing. And if we go to the next slide, you can see that it's also partially from disease. In the 1980s in the Channel Islands, we discovered a disease in black abalone called withering syndrome. Withering syndrome is caused by a bacterium that infects the abalone's esophagus. Um, and basically, it um, prevents the abalone from digesting their food properly. And so they kind of digest their foot, their foot shrinks, and they fall off the rock and die. Why did we discover it in the 1980s? Because it was an El Nino time, so the water was warmer. And the interesting thing about this disease is that it's temperature dependent. Um, it has slowly moved up the coast. We now find it in Bodega Bay and a little bit further north than that. Um, but it really hit black abalone in particular very hard and probably impacted some of the other abalone, um, less so the deeper abalone that were in cooler water. So we go to the next slide, please. This is a graph of the total amount of commercial harvest of abalone from 1940s until the fishery closed in 1997. And you can see this, the axis here is in millions of pounds. If you go forward, that's representing white abalone catch. Okay, go back again and go forward again. Did you see that? There's a little carrot there or just past 1970 that represents white abalone. You have, probably have to squint to see it. So let's blow that up. Let's go forward one more slide. This is, look, notice the difference in axes on these two, these two graphs. So on top we have millions of pounds, on the bottom we have thousands of pounds. And what you see in this graph is that white abalone did not represent a very large proportion of the abalone harvest in California. Um, and it was really concentrated in, in a decade, in the 1970s. Um, so why are they in such bad shape? If we go forward one more. The blue bars here represent, the, on top, the total white abalone commercial landings of greater than 280 metric tons. And the bottom are the white abalone remaining, fewer than two metric tons. So one more slide forward. That's a 99% loss in just about a decade. Even though we didn't take as many white abalone as we did of these other species, we took pretty much all of them. And that's why this species is in trouble. So let's learn a little bit more about white abalone. Next slide, please. Um, they're historically, I said they're the deepest of all abalone species in California. They're about 20 to 65 meters. Now the remnant population is mostly below 30 meters. And historically, they ranged all the way from Point Conception down into Baja, both on the mainland, on the offshore islands, and on offshore banks. Now their remnant population is pretty much relegated to those offshore banks. There are very few along the mainland, um, very few around the Channel Islands. They get to be about 20 to 25 centimeters long, and they live to be about 30 years, we know from radiocarbon dating. This is interesting because we don't think there really has been any successful recruitment of white abalone since the 1970s. Um, and we think they only live 30 years. So that they're, they're really in trouble. Um, maybe some of them live a little longer. Maybe there's been some recruitment that we haven't seen, um, but they're really in trouble. And the current population is declining at a rate of 14% per year. The other issue with their current population is they're really, really low density. Abalone are broadcast spawners, so they release their eggs and sperm into the water column. If a female is releasing her eggs in one location and a male is just a few feet away releasing his eggs, they might not ever meet, or so I guess, sorry, Let's back up. The male is releasing sperm. He's not releasing eggs. The female is over here releasing her eggs. The male is over here releasing his sperm. Um, if those animals are more than two meters apart, it is highly unlikely that those gametes will ever meet. Most of the remaining abalone in the wild are singletons. They aren't near any animal of their same species. 
Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that in some places, this species is effectively already extinct because the animals that are left are not able to reproduce. So that brought us to kind of where we are today in this dire strait and needing to save the species quickly. Um, if we go to the next slide, we had a group of really great scientists get together in um, the 90s and discuss what we need to do with the species. And the species was first listed in 2001. Um, if, we can, if we can go forward one when you're ready. Um, so we collected about 20 broodstock from the wild in 2000 and 2003. And then again, um, the, the abalone were first listed in 2001. If we go forward again. Um, in 2001 and 2003, we actually had a ton of hope with, for white abalone. So um, around this time, people have been farming abalone all over the world for a fair amount of time. So we thought, OK, we're going to list the species, and um, we'll just farm them just like we farm red abalone. It'll be no big deal. We'll put a bunch back out in the wild. We'll save them. You know, we could all pat ourselves on the back and go home. And early success indicated that was going to be the case. So the Channel Islands Marine Resource Institute spawned these animals in 2001 and 2003, hugely successful. Over 100,000 juveniles were produced, and there was a lot of hope for what was going to happen. If we go forward a little bit further, though, when those animals were just a few months old, unfortunately, almost all of them perished from disease. So I mentioned that disease at the beginning, withering foot syndrome. At the time, we didn't have a great appreciation for how much it affected white abalone. Um, we knew it affected black abalone. Um, unfortunately, because the white abalone in captivity are experiencing surface waters that are warmer than maybe they did in their natural habitat, they, um, they were subject to this disease. So moving forward some more, um, it, there was basically no successful captive reproduction of white abalone for about a decade um, for a variety of reasons. Part of this was the disease. Part of this was um, the facilities that the broodstock were being held in. And it was decided around 2008 that the program would move. And in 2011, the program actually, um, BML got the permit for rearing um, and breeding captive white abalone. So we go forward one more. From those original 20 animals that were collected in the wild, we have one that's remaining in captivity. And from those original 100,000 juveniles that were produced in 2001 and 2003, we have 50 remaining. Just like you don't want to keep all of your eggs in one basket, you don't want to keep all of your endangered animals in one tank. So we have these animals distributed among five different facilities. We have the one wild animal and 15 of the broodstock at the UC Davis Bodega Marine Lab. And then we also have animals at UC Santa Barbara Marine Science Institute in Santa Barbara, the Sea Center in Santa Barbara, Cabrillo Marine Aquarium in San Pedro, and Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. Um, and as I mentioned in the very first slide, these are also really important partners in this. So um, the great thing, particularly about the bottom three institutions, is that they're aquaria. So people can go there and they can see these animals and they can interact with them. And some of these places also have small captive breeding programs of their own. So we can combine our expertise and knowledge. We don't have our, all of our animals in one place. We can try different things with our animals. Um, but the fact remains that 50 broodstock for this kind of species is very, very few. And those 50 broodstock are all related, more or less. Um, the one wild has different parentage, obviously, um, but we're pretty much dealing with, with cousins and siblings and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. Why Bodega Marine Lab? Um, so this is a really big question. I mentioned that these animals are from Southern California. Bodega Marine Lab is definitely about an hour and a half north of the Golden Gate. So they're way out of white abalone native range. Um, the reason that this program was chosen to be centered at Bodega Marine Lab was because of the amazing amount of expertise that we have at BML. Gary Chur is our director, and I mentioned he is the permit holder for white abalone. He is an expert in reproduction and development, particularly of invertebrate species. Um, Jim Moore is the shellfish health expert for California. This is one of those jobs I wish I knew existed when I was in high school. Um, this is what a cool job to be the shellfish health expert for a state. Um, so he kind of not only, only works with abalone, but with oysters and other species as well. And then Dr. Laura Rogers Bennett, um, she works um, also, I should say, but both Jim and Laura have joint appointments with UC Davis and with Cal Fish and Wildlife. Um, and Laura is an expert in abalone ecology and larval ecology. Um, and she works with some of the, the pre preparing for field outplanting of these animals. So we go forward two more. Um, 
this is kind of the overview of what we have with, with this program. These are all the folks involved. Um, we have our folks at the Bodega Marine Lab. We have everyone in Southern California. NOAA is the um, project coordinator as far as the government is concerned. They also, we also have a lot of partners at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. Um, they are working with pink abalone and hopefully doing some work there that might inform some of our white abalone work. They're also in charge of actually surveying these animals in the wild. So they bring their submersible vehicles out into these offshore banks and try to monitor the wild population and what's going on with them. Before the slide, please. Okay, so we're going to start with abalone health because um, you can't really have a healthy captive breeding program unless you have healthy adults. And we know that disease was a big issue early on in this program. Um, so the first thing we really need to do is make sure that our animals are healthy. So we don't have 100,000 juveniles again, and then suddenly only have 50 of those remaining. Jim Moore, as I mentioned, he's up here, um, is our shellfish health expert. And on the top right, you see a picture of a shrunken white abalone. Um, this is what we don't want in the program. And Fortunately, Jim is really an expert in this field, so he has been instrumental in identifying weathering syndrome and tracking it and figuring out ways to prevent it and actually in developing ways to treat it. So Jim and colleagues have developed this antibiotic bath treatment, you can see on the bottom right, and we could submerge these animals in this oxytetracycline bath um, a few times and it, it allows them to kind of shed or expel that bacteria that's in their gut and it cures them of the disease as long as we catch it soon enough. So that's been really, really important. And we monitor all of our animals um, regularly. We test their feces. We use PCR techniques to make sure that they are healthy. And right now, um, our, all of our animals who are in treated seawater um, are free of this disease. And if they ever do get this disease, we can catch it quickly, and then we can treat them. The next slide. The other thing that we worry about in terms of disease is things that can get into the animal's shells. So there's lots of sponges and worms and clams and things that would love to live in an abalone shell. The problem is we have to handle these animals fairly often, and so we don't want their shell to become brittle because there's lots of things living in it. Um, and we also don't want those kind of holes that animals can make to open up space for infection. So we, um, next slide, we wax our animals regularly. Um, we, historically, we've used a combination of paraffin, and, paraffin wax and Vaseline. We just actually were a little bit worried about the Vaseline putting petroleum products on an endangered species. So the last time we waxed, we used a combination of organic beeswax and organic coconut oil, which smelled quite lovely. Um, so we, we paint the animals with this wax. Um, and actually, I have a shell here. Um, if you guys are in the room, you can come up and see it afterwards. It has this wax treatment on it. Our white abalone are even more white than white abalone in the wild because they have this wax on it. And the wax basically suffocates any of those boring organisms that could be on the shell. And it chips off on its own pretty quickly, it doesn't hurt the animal at all, um, and it keeps their shells nice and healthy because we need to move them around quite a bit. So we have healthy animals now. Go to the next slide. Let's breed them. Um, oh, too far. Or you're okay. Okay, <laughs> we, have, we have two different slide, slide movers going on. Um, okay, so I mentioned that in 2011, BML was issued the white abalone permit. There have been no captive breeding success since 2003. Really exciting. In 2012, we had our first success in nearly a decade. We have about 13 animals from that success. Um, in 2013, we had success again. We have 125 or so animals from that success. And this year, we were successful again. And I'll get to this a little bit later. I don't know quite how many animals we have from this year yet. They're still really, really tiny, so they're really hard to count. But I'm really, really hopeful about this year. And I think that we might have um, at least order of magnitude increase in growth um, in this program. So, so we're doing really well. Um, but what does that mean? So we've, we've had these successes. We're really excited because we hadn't had success in so long. Um, but how much success do we need for this program to, to actually recover this species? So if we go to the next slide, um, Dr. Cynthia Catton works at Bodega Marine Lab and is also a Fish and Wildlife employee. And she's done some really great modeling work trying to get at the scope of these outplanting efforts. What do we need to do? Um, how, how, what are we thinking about in terms of how many years do we need to do this and how many animals? And this is very theoretical work, but it's really unique in that she put density into these models. And that's not something that generally happens with um, recovery models. 
And it, we know it's really important for abalone because they have to be close together in order to reproduce successfully. So these models are done over a 20 hectare acre um, of recovery, and they assume that there are no, ant, no white abalone in that area to begin with, and they model different outplanting inputs. Um, so the top shows putting different numbers of animals out in year one and seeing how the trajectory of recovery um, plays out over time. The take home from that is that we really need to put thousands of animals out each year or um, in order for us to really to recover this species. The bottom graph kind of explains how different amounts of inputs over time affect recovery rate. So putting all of those, putting 1,200 juveniles in at once in year one or spreading that input out over time. And the take home from that graph is basically that a large effort right away is much more effective than smaller efforts over time. Um, and again, this is very theoretical and a lot of the data behind these models come from other species because we don't have a lot of data on white abalone. But I think that we, we can get a good understanding of order of magnitude here. It's gonna take a while to recover the species and we really need to have high inputs in order to recover them. So go to the next slide. So we're excited about our reproductive success so far, um, but we, we have a good sense of where we need to go from here, and we still have some challenges to overcome. I wanna talk a little bit about the logistics of actually breeding these animals in captivity, so that way we can get into what do we need to do to, you know, what work is there to be done to restore this species. So this is a really beautiful in illustration that was made of white abalone reproduction, and that's an adult white abalone in the center there. It's a male, he's spawning his sperm, and that those sperm collect, or those sperm um, fertilize an egg. That egg hangs around and develops um, as an embryo for about 24 hours, and then a swimming larvae comes out. Um, the swimming larvae develops and hangs out for about a week, and then eventually settles and starts eating and turns into a crawling snail. And then it starts to look much more like the animal we all think of as an abalone. So that's kind of the general reproduction, re reproductive biology of this animal. If we go to the next slide, I have a video of what this looks like, and it should play on its own.
Hope you enjoyed that video. Um, I'm gonna, since I didn't narrate the video myself, at least there, there are words on there, so hopefully you got a good sense of what was going on. We're gonna kind of go through all those different things that were highlighted in the video again. Um, so don't feel like you missed anything. Um, so we, we, what does it mean to actually go and do this? Um, most of our facilities are in Southern California. We're spawning those animals too. It's really easy when we're at Bodega Marine Lab and we can just use our own animals. But when we spawn animals in Southern California, we drive down the day before. Um, so say we're going to Santa Barbara. We get to the MSI building at about 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the morning, um, unpack our equipment, get the animals going. We take their vitals. Um, we look at their gonads. We put them in solutions of hydrogen peroxide that gets them to spawn. So hydrogen peroxide is good for getting abalone spawn because it creates free radicals in the water. We think that that's the same process that happens when another animal is spawning. So these are broadcast spawners. If you know Joe over there is going, I better go too. Otherwise, I'm going to miss my chance. Um, so the, it gets them all to go at once. UV radiation of seawater also does the same thing. It creates these free radicals. And so that's another way to um, spawn these animals. We prefer hydrogen peroxide method for a couple of reasons. One, it's um, not all the facilities that we work at have UV units. And two, you need flowing seawater. So you need constant UV radiation inputted water in order to get abalone to spawn with that method. And with this method, you can just put the chemical in the, bu in the bucket and they tend to go. So, um, so I think our spawning methods are quite good. When an animal has gametes to give, they give them to us. Um, so here we have a, a male and female spawning and that fertilization. We go to the next slide. This process takes to, to about four o'clock in the afternoon or so, and then we have to pack everything up and we have to bring the embryos back to Bodega Marine Lab. So we use locking Tupperwares. And then um, the bottom right shows a picture we have. We put these in coolers with ice. We have to maintain the temperature um, at about 11 or 12 degrees for the entire drive back up to Bodega Marine Lab. So we tape a little digital thermometer to the back of the truck so we can monitor that temperature on the way up. And we generally get to Bodega Marine Lab at about 12 or one o'clock in the morning. Um, next slide. We put those animals into our larval culture system. We have hatching trays on the upper left that we put those embryos into. They sink to the bottom. When they hatch, they swim up, and they end up kind of helping themselves down to the larval buckets that were on the bottom left. Um, after about a week of swimming around, we settle them onto plates that are covered with diatoms, which is what they like to eat when they first settle. Next slide. And here's that kind of early development. The video mentioned that this, this transition that they're making from a swimming, non-feeding larvae to a crawling, feeding snail is really energetically costly. We expect a lot of mortality during this stage. And in fact, we expect 95 to 99% mortality in those first two or three months post-settlement. This isn't out of the ordinary for abalone. Red abalone farms that have their methods down pat expect as much mortality during this stage. So this is just part of the natural history of this animal. However, if we're starting with hundreds of thousands of embryos, changing that settlement success rate by just one or 2% is a lot of animals. So this is one really active area of research that if we can really increase their post-settlement survival just a tad, um, we could have a lot more success in our captive breeding program. So if we go to the next slide, um, a few of the things that we're thinking about the first is, is our settlement cues. Um, so right now, we use this stuff called GABA to settle them. And GABA is a chemical that's naturally, or similar to a chemical naturally released by coralline algae. So encrust, that pink encrusting algae that, that you might see if you're diving in the ocean. 
And it's kind of, you can also buy it in the health food store. It makes you relax. It kind of does the same thing for abalone. Um, it makes them sink to the bottom and test the substrate. Um, so it's a good settlement cue. There is some evidence that perhaps GABA isn't the best thing long term for these animals. In a culture situation, we want them all to settle at the same time. And abalone only have a finite amount of yolk. So if they don't settle soon enough, they won't have enough yolk to make that really energetically costly transition. So we want them to settle at the right time. Um, and so right now, using this chemical is, it seems like it's the best thing. But maybe there's something better. Maybe there, we, there's something more natural that we can do or something like that. Um, we settle them on diatoms. Um, because when, when they first settle, they need to eat really, really small diatoms because their mouths are really, really small. And bacterial films are also probably really important. Um, we are so worried about disease with these animals that we sterilize the crap out of our seawater. So we filter it down to about five microns and we UV treat it and make sure there's nothing that could possibly be living in that seawater because we don't want them to get this bacterium that causes the withering syndrome. Abalone are herbivores. Most herbivores need some sort of bacteria in their gut in order to digest their food. And so it's possible that there are really beneficial bacteria that we're excluding from our system because we're so afraid of disease. And that's, again, probably OK right now. If we don't have living broodstock, we have no captive breeding program. And we only have 50 of those living broodstock. So it is really important for us to have clean, sterile systems. Um, but is there some sort of happy medium? Are there bacteria we could introduce to the system? Are there certain levels we could introduce um, that could make sure that we're not getting this withering syndrome, but that way we can make sure that they're getting any sort of beneficial bacteria that they might need? Um, so this, that's, those are some of the things we're doing. If we um, should also, I guess I'm not sure what the next slide is. Can we go to the next slide? Right, go back one, please. Thank you very much. Um, so this, these pictures are of our initial captive breeding system. We use this, this series of wavy, pl wavy plates. Um, in the top right, you can see little dots of white on those plates. Those are abalone. And the system is great because you can have like a single tank, and you can make that tank have really high surface area because you can put a bunch of plates in there. Um, you can lay the plates out horizontally, get those animals to settle on them, turn those plates vertically, and then there's, there's lots of space for lots of animals. There's a couple challenges, though. One is getting water flow to be even through all those plates. Abalone like quite high flow. Um, the other hard part is actually delivering food to the animals. So when they're really, really small and their mouths are really small, it's really easy for them to get overgrown by their food. Can you imagine like, just getting overgrown by pasta or something and suffocating <laughs> because you couldn't eat it fast enough? I mean, that's basically what's happening to these animals if there's too much diatoms around. It's just the diatoms grow faster than the abalone. They get covered. They, get suff they suffocate. It's terrible. Um, it's not a good way to go, or so I would imagine. Um, so that's, that's no good. Um, the other problem is, though, what if the diatoms aren't going fast enough? So we have lots of abalone. They're eating really quickly. And you can only turn the light on so high so the diatoms grow so much. Um, so that was a really big challenge with this system is trying to you know, get the perfect amount of food for these animals, especially when they're really tiny and really sensitive. So we go to the next slide. We have a new system for our settlement, which involves these troughs. And one more slide forward. These troughs contain um, these little ceramic tiles um, that are laid at an angle, which improves water flow along the trough. And it's pretty shallow, so it's easier to control light, which e makes it easier to control diatom growth. And it's also, because there's mostly horizontal surfaces here, much easier to deliver food to the animals if we ever need to. So we can make sure that they're not having too much diatoms by, by manipulating our light sources. And then if for some reason that all of a sudden there isn't enough, we can pour some in and they have enough food. We can also manipulate the type maybe of diatoms that they have or the type of food they have. So there are some kinds of um, shellfish diet and things that we can try to put into the system that might improve their survivorship early on. Diet diversity is likely important for them. Um, so we can do things like that. And one more slide forward. I mentioned earlier that it's really, really hard to um, count how many animals that we have right now. I took this picture a week ago. And um, so this is a game, right? I want you to try to find the two abalone in this picture. A hint is I'm pointing at one of them um, <laughs> with my finger. So if you go forward one more, Okay, there's one of them. Do you guys see that one? And there's one more. Okay, go forward. Uh, okay, yeah. So they're, they're small. And I can go through and I can take a flashlight and I can find some of them. Um, but, but they're still really tiny. And this is about two and a half months old, um, two, two to two and a half months old. Um, so they, they grow about a millimeter or so a month. Next slide. In addition to trying to figure out how to increase that post-settlement survivorship, we need to figure out how to get more gametes out of these animals. So I mentioned that our spawning methods, I think, are pretty good. 
when animals have gametes to give us, we get them um, by, giving, by putting them in these hydrogen peroxide baths. But the animals aren't becoming that ripe to begin with. So um, normally, a really ripe female abalone should spawn three to six million eggs. We're getting about 300,000 eggs from ripe female abalone. And so we're an order of magnitude fewer than what we should be getting. Um, and it's probably because these animals are missing some sort of important environmental cue that lets them know when it's time to spawn. In the video, it mentioned that abalone, white abalone generally spawn in the springtime. And so maybe there is a change in day length, or a change in temperature, or a change in the availability of some sort of kelp that lets them know that, oh, spring is coming. I better put some energy into my gonad. In the bottom left here, you can see some pictures of abalone gonad. Um, the one on the far left, there's basically no gonad there at all. So abalone gonad is interesting. It's basically a cone that surrounds the digestive gland. So the best way I have of describing this, which maybe isn't very good, is I don't know if you ever remember, you remember the cone heads? Um, maybe the younger folks in here don't, but um, they had these really big cone heads. And so the, the head of the cone head is like the digestive gland. And the gonad is like a hat around that cone. Um, and so the, the picture on the far left, that's pretty much just digestive gland. There is not any gonad on top of that. Um, the picture that's kind of in the middle on the bottom, that's a female abalone, and there's a little bit of gonad tissue over that digestive gland. It's hard to see. Um, these animals are, because they're not super ripe, it's hard to tell when they're, they have anything for you. Um, but, but getting them to become more ripe is a really key part of this process. If we go forward one more slide, um, we've had new facilities that we're really excited about that seem to be working well to try to condition our adult brood stock so that they become more reproductive. Our lights are attached to an astronomic clock, so they go on and off the same time the sun rises and sets in Southern California. So that's great. They're getting natural photo period changes. Um, our seawater system has controlled temperature. Right now, we keep all the animals at 14, which is warm enough that they're growing well, cool enough that they're not going to get withering syndrome um, if they happen to get the bacterium because our UV unit fails or something like that, which hopefully it won't. Um, but it also allows us to manipulate temperature. So eventually, we can do experiments or we figure out if the water drops you know, three degrees for three months, then suddenly they become reproductive, something like that. Um, we, can, we can manipulate those things. And then we also are really interested in their diet. Um, white abalone love kelp, giant macrocystis, giant kelp. Um, it's, like, it's like Twinkies to them. It's delicious. They'll eat it up. But they don't grow great on just kelp. Um, so this algae that's on the bottom right is called dulse. It's a red algae. You can also get this at the health food store. Um, it's really proteinaceous. And so we try to get them to eat some of this. For them, it is like eating spinach. They don't like eating it as much. But even just getting a little bit of that helps them grow better and hopefully helps them become more reproductive. So this is a really active area of research. If we go forward a slide. And as I mentioned, one really exciting thing about white abalone is that they become reproductive at a really young age. So at just a year old, white abalone become reproductive. Other abalone species take three, four, five years to become reproductive for the first time. So this is great for a captive breeding program. A one-year-old white abalone isn't going to give us very many gametes, but maybe they're really high quality. Or maybe we have enough one-year-olds that we can get enough that, that um, we, have, we have some healthy juveniles from that. So here's some photos of white abalone development. Um, the, the photo on the left is of a male at a, about a year old, and the white part is the, the sperm developing in its gonad. And on the right-hand side, on top is a male white abalone, and on the bottom is a female white abalone. Also, another interesting thing about abalone is they're really hard to sex. So red abalone, their eggs are this bluish green color. So if you look at a red abalone gonad, you see bluish green, you know it's a female. Um, if you see milky white, you know it's a male. White abalone have milky white eggs, so it's much more challenging to sex them. But I feel like I've looked at it enough now, and you can kind of see in this picture, white, the females tend to be a little bit more gray colored, and the males tend to be a bit more yellow white um, when they're ripe. So, so this is really cool that they're, they're doing this well. And actually, the pictures that are on the right we just took last week as well of our 2013 broodstock. So they seem to be coming up well. And what we're hoping is, I, mean, I mentioned we keep having more and more success with our captive breeding. We finally have enough animals that we can start doing experiments. Before this, if you only have 16 animals, you can't really do anything experimental with those animals um, and have any sort of confidence in what you're doing. And so um, with these kind of 125 or so 2013 animals, we're hoping to actually do some experimental manipulations with things like photoperiod to see if we can get them to come up at different rates or at different times um, and, and hopefully at greater capacities than what we've seen so far 
in the captive broodstock. Next slide, please. The final thing that we, well, not the final, there's, there's way more in the future that we need to do, but in terms of the captive breeding program, um, the, third, so the third big thing that I think we need to focus on is the genetic integrity of our broodstock. I mentioned at the beginning, we only have one wild white abalone remaining in captivity. Um, that is our genetic diversity, more or less. Um, the 2001 animals and the 2003 animals all came from that first initial collection. That was their parents. So all the other animals in captivity were reared in captivity. So we have a permit modification request in to collect new broodstock. And we are hoping to do this very, very soon because as Cynthia's models suggest, the faster we get animals out in the wild, then the faster the species will recover. Um, and collecting new broodstock, we think, is important not just for introducing new genes into this population, but also because those, that first success in 2001 that was so great came from animals that had just been collected from the wild. If these animals really are missing some sort of important environmental cue in captivity that's keeping them from becoming reproductive, they might still be experiencing that in the wild. And so if we can take a few animals from the wild, bring them into captivity, spawn them right away, have a really, really big success like the one we had in 2011, we're in a whole new playing field with this species and this recovery program. Um, and most likely, I mean, most, most, most likely, those animals aren't going to reproduce at all in the wild. Maybe they're becoming ripe, which is our hope because of these environmental cues, but they aren't next to any other animals. Even if there's one other animal near it, there's a 50% chance that it's of the same sex. So they have so much higher capacity to reproduce and to contribute to the population if we can bring a few of them into captivity than if we keep um, the few that are remaining in the wild. We obviously don't want to take all of them from the wild. There's probably a few thousand left in the wild. We'd like to collect you know, a few dozen and bring them into captivity to really bolster this breeding program. And secondly, in the next slide, um, we are also looking into trying to cryopreserve sperm. So we do have one group of animals that was spawned in 2001 and one group of animals that was spawned in 2003, the, their parents are not actually related. So even though they're all captive animals, we have some genetic diversity in our captive population. And so when we spawn animals in Southern California, we try to do joint spawning attempts with institutions that have both of those populations. So we put priority in crossing those two populations together. Um, but cryopreservation of sperm might also help us be able to um, really coordinate who's getting crossed with who much better. So if we have one year where we only have animals from 2001 spawn, but we're able to cryopreserve some sperm, and next year a female from the 2003 population spawns, we can make a 2001 by 2003 animal cross and have a little bit more genetic diversity. So those are two things that I think we need to do also for this program to be successful. And next slide, please. Um, the next, so that, that's captive breeding. The next big thing is actually getting these animals back out in the wild. We are really hopeful with the amount of success that we've had that really soon we will be able to think seriously about putting some of these animals out in the next year or so. Um, and we already have efforts that are kind of preparing some little habitats for them in the wild. These are in Southern California. And Ian Taniguchi, who works for the department, um, it has a big hand in making sure that these are up and running. Um, and they're basically lobster traps with broken cinder blocks in them. And those cinder blocks are so close together that it, there's really nice habitat in there for really tiny abalone. There's a lot of predators, a lot of things that would really love to eat a baby white abalone besides us in the wild, so octopus and a little um, crabs and things like that. Um, sea stars would love to eat these animals. So giving them a kind of habitat that those animals can't, those predators can't get into as easily and will be important in terms of putting them back out in the wild. So we're already kind of trying to think about that. We're already seasoning some of these habitats, so that way they have nice algal growth on them and a nice biotic community for these animals to go into. And they're all in marine protected areas. They're all in areas that we know that they're white abalone historically. Um, so hopefully the animals can thrive once they get into the, these, these little baby abalone recruitment traps or barts. Next slide. So I just want to summarize here a little bit. Um, go forward one. So there's kind of three main things that I think we still need to focus on with captive breeding. If you go forward, just three things. Um, so if the first is reproductive conditioning. Um, we need to, if we have more gametes to work with, we have more offspring. Um, the second is getting that post-settlement survival survivorship to be just a little bit higher than it is right now, knowing that it's not going to be 100% because that's not the life history of the species. But even increasing it a little bit will give us a lot more juveniles to work with. And then finally, with the captive breeding, we need to really um, focus on the genetic integrity of our captive population. 
so far we've been operating on just we need more. And that's still true, that even if we're breeding brothers and sisters, we need more animals. We have so few that even an inbred animal is a good animal at this point. Um, but that's not a long-term solution for these animals. And then if we go forward, oh, so those are the three things I think we really need to work on. But the really exciting thing, I think, is that our captive breeding success is really steadily increasing. Um, and I maybe even rapidly increasing if I go out on a limb and say that. I think we're doing a really good job with the very limited amount of um, resources that we have. So um, there is not a lot of funding for this work. Um, there's not a lot of resources for this work. But despite the fact that we haven't actually been able to do anything experimental yet, we're having this greater success. And I think that that, that, that bodes well for the species. That's a lot of hope. Um, if we go forward two more, or three more, that's good. Um, so uh, then, then comes the next step. Once we get this captive breeding stuff down, um, what, is, what are our future recovery goals? We need to make sure that um, we can successfully outplant these animals, that when they get back into the wild, they're healthy, they're um, and that they're also reproducing when they're out there to really um, make sure that this species can recover. And if we go forward one more, the, the good caveat here is that white abalone habitat is intact. So it's not like trying to restore delta smelt where you could have gazillions delta smelt and you have nowhere to put them um, because their habitat is so degraded. The kind of elegant thing about white abalone is that really the reason that they are going extinct is because we took too many. Their habitat is there. So if we can put some back, then they should be fine. Um, and I think that this is really a species that should be relatively easy to restore. We have all the tools that we need. Yes, there are a few challenges that we need to get through, um, but I think that we have all of the expertise and all of the facilities to, to surmount any of these kinds of things. Um, so I think there's a lot of hope, a lot of hope for white abalone. And I want to restore white abalone because I want to eat one one day. Um, <laughs> I hear that white abalone are the most delicious of all abalone species. Um, they're, they're apparently the most tender. I've heard that you don't even have to pound them. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but, but yes, hopefully that's where we're going. Yeah, thank you all very much for your time. Um, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. So there's a trade-off with how deep they can be. We want them deep enough so they don't get withering syndrome, but they need to be shallow enough that we can access them as divers. So if they're down below 100 feet where we know it's super cold, then that's just going to be too hard to know even what's going on. Um, so the, most of the, the um, modulars that are out there are in about 70 feet of water, um, which is hopefully kind of a happy medium between those two things. But I think you're right. We're putting these animals into a place where we know withering syndrome exists. So most likely, the animals are going to have the bacterium as soon as they're outplanted. And they have been naive to that bacterium the entire time they've been in captivity. So that could be another issue, that even if it was cold, but they never experienced this bacterium before, is that some sort of a stress for them? And we have some ideas. And one thing we really want to do with outplanting work, and even with captive breeding work in general, is to partner with abalone farms. So we've talked a lot to, with Doug Bush at the Cultured Abalone um, and other abalone farmers. Because at some point, the scale of this might need to be bigger than a research institution or an aquarium can handle, um, especially if having really, really high output for five or 10 years is really all that matters. Then perhaps you know, we, we collaborate with a farm and we get that capacity up. Um, but those are also places that could be kind of halfway houses for abalone. So we have our, our laboratory um, that's really pristine and really nice, it's like a prison. And then we put them in the halfway house that has this raw seawater and they start to like interact with other you know, microbes or whatever for a little bit before they're actually put out in the wild again. Um, and so that might be a really important partnership and an important thing to do as well. Um, and, and I think, yeah, that, that is probably another one of the biggest black boxes is how are these animals going to cope with disease once they're in the wild? The, most of the abalone in Southern California tend to be coping with this disease. So there is hope that you know, if they're reproducing out there and there's some genetic diversity in their population, this disease won't be um, as catastrophic as it was like in 1980 when there was a big El Nino and it kind of hit them for the first time. There are black abalone populations that seem to be genetically resistant to this disease. And also really exciting is that in a black abalone population, there seems to be a bacteriophage that's attacking the bacterium. Um, and that's something that could spread among species. So it does seem like wild animals are developing some mechanisms to cope with this. And that gives us a lot of hope, too, in terms of outplanting. That's a great question. Um, 
OA work has not, there hasn't been a lot of OA work done with abalone yet. Um, there are folks at the Bodega Marine Lab who are really interested in starting up some of that work, and I've been talking to some colleagues about doing, starting some of that. It's also interesting because a lot of the OA work that I'm aware of has been done on larvae that feed. So we know that ocean acidification um, is mostly impacting, or is probably most harmful to animals that are at really small um, developmental stages, because they have the least capacity to deal with it. But even these larvae that are really small, like urchin larvae and oyster larvae, are feeding larvae. So they may have some ability to kind of compensate for the stress or whatever kind of you know, detrimental effects OA is having. Abalone larvae can't do that. They just have their yolk and that's it. Um, so they may kind of react to OA in a different way than some of the other species we've looked at so far. Um, OA is probably a concern down there for sure, um, just like it is everywhere in the ocean. One thing that's different between Northern and Southern California is there's a lot less upwelling in Southern California. Um, upwell waters tend to be naturally more acidic. And so in some ways, um, some of the animals in Southern California are probably experiencing less acidic water than maybe they are in some of the upwelling areas in Northern California and Oregon. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, climate change, whether it's OA or temperatures or anything like that, um, that's something that I think hopefully we can address with having high genetic integrity of the animals that we are outplanting. Um, some of them will die for sure. Some of them won't be able to make it. But if we have some sort of great genetic diversity, hopefully the most of them will be able to cope or adapt. Kristen, I was intrigued by the um, animals that are maturing in a year. And it, I, I think the causes are way, way different uh, when I relate it to sturgeon and captivity versus the wild. But I'm wondering if you've noticed any difference. Uh, I don't think you have any way to measure or compare, but do you have a sense that these larvae are growing at a faster rate in captivity? Or, or do you think that they're growing fairly similar, similarly to what they experience in the wild? That's a great question. I have no idea. Um, it's so hard. I mean, it's hard to find a larval abalone at all, and there's really no way you're going to find a larval white abalone. Um, so I'm, I guess, I mean, maybe someone like Laura Rogers Bennett might know um, or know someone who has done a little bit more work with larval animals in the wild, um, at least to know how big they are at certain stages and things like that. But my sense is that the, the larval stage isn't that different in captivity than it is in the wild. Um, but yeah, we don't have much data to support that. Thank you all very much. Thank you.